everybody. Welcome to CNET's Next Big Thing. Great to have you here. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here yet again with a lot of familiar faces here at CES 2014. I'm joined by editor-at-large Tim Stevens this year. And it's a real pleasure to have him with us. Hello and welcome to this edition that uh, is in our 10th year, by the way, and I am Brian Cooley. And I'm Tim Stevens, and we are on a cusp of a major shift in innovation driven by what our hardware senses and not just what it does. And if you want to join us on Twitter, which I hope you will, we've got our hashtag set up as CNETNBT. So CNET, next big thing, just CNETNBT will get you through that. And for those folks who are here in the room, we are going to be giving you an opportunity to ask us some questions. So now would be a good time to start thinking of some good ones. Now, let's get right into it. Uh, now that we've got some frameworks set up, you want to know what is the next big thing this year. I'm sure you're uh, itching to find out where that's taking us. Let's take a look now at how devices from smartwatches to televisions and everything in between that wide spectrum of size and scope are getting closer to each of us by knowing what we are doing and almost intending in some very different ways. Take a look. Today's so-called personal technology, in many ways, isn't. We poke at unnatural QWERTY keyboards, stab at touch interfaces of varying understandability, and repeat ourselves to clunky voice recognition tech. Please try again. What if it was just more natural? Sensor-based hardware that interprets the movements we make, the words we're saying, Text mom, I'm running late. Even the direction we're looking is about to revolutionize consumer electronics. Connected glasses will augment our view of the world by following our gaze, knowing our location, and mining our preferences. Fitness bands measure steps, stairs, and sleep to feed apps that nudge us to live and feel just a little better. Through smart home controls, today's dumb dwellings will know when we're home or be able to guess when we will be. Saving energy and having things just the way we want them with less work, not more. And home entertainment is now responding to gesture and voice instead of arcane remotes and program guides. There's even a soccer ball that reads your footwork. But as devices sense more, they need to present it elegantly or just risk being complicated with more data. And nothing says privacy intrusion more than a technology that can read your life without you inputting anything. This will be a new frontier in user respect for an industry that hasn't always been the best at that. And as this trend brings CE closer to each of us, designers must respond with devices we covet enough to wear, not just accept. The future will be sensed. Let's find out how we get there. All right, this is topic one at CES this year. It threads through almost everything at the show. Let's meet the minds that are going to help us discover what's moving this revolution forward. First out, Sonny Vu is CEO of Misfit Wearables and makers of The Shine. Sonny Vu. Sonny, welcome. A great-looking wearable fitness and activity tracker. Sonny, go ahead and take your seat. Thanks for being with us. Now, Mike Bell is Vice President and General Manager of the New Devices Group at Intel. Please help us welcome him on stage as well. Hey, Mike. Welcome. Good to see you. Thanks, Mike. Good to see you. Jim Bukowski is Director of Electrical and Electronic Innovation at Ford's Research and Innovation Center. Hey, Jim. Hey, welcome. And don't miss some Ford vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle tech and the new Mustang showing in a couple places here at the show as well. And Julie Larson-Green is Executive Vice President, Devices and Studios at Microsoft. That includes the Xbox team. Bring on Julie. Hey, Julie. Welcome. Thanks for being here, Julie. Why don't you sit on there? I'm going to be here because the camera insists that I be here. We're putting ugly on this end. That's what we're doing. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> what a warm welcome. <laughs> yeah, very good. All right. So, uh... Let's get started here. Uh, first of all, jump ball question for all of you. What kind of sensor technology first came to mind when we put this opportunity out to you? What did you think, oh, that's what they're looking for? What's kind of a hot button in your mind that you expected this to be about? So we can kind of plumb your top of mind. <laughs> Not all at once. Well, uh, okay, I'll start. The sensor will Sensors? overload if we do no. that. I'll, I'll, st I'll start. I, um Again, I'm coming from the auto industry, relating to the kind of things we're doing is uh, sensors in our seats in a vehicle. So we can sense the occupant, not only the simple things, but things like uh, heart rate. 
as an example. We talked about examples where um, you know, we can help um, provide feedback to, to customers to improve the, their driving environment. And Jim, I noticed that you're wearing a pebble there, and you're also wearing a shine as well, right? I so am. That's not, 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 not and I, as I mentioned, uh, not uh, uh, specifically because uh, I was going to be on this panel. I did buy it. Uh, I think uh, um, it's really the combination of utility, the, the experience, as well as how it looks. Um, I enjoy my, my uh, pebble. I just uh, got it before the holidays, but I do have a lot better looking watches than this pebble, so I do enjoy this, the look of the shine. <laughs> That's so. a topic point we're going to cover later as we talk about design of these devices. Other high points on sensors, Julie? Yeah, for me, I think it was more of a kind of a walk down memory lane on t different ways that we've had inflections of hardware, software, and services coming together. And I thought all the way back to uh, Microsoft's first idea, the interaction of gesture with uh, voice with, I don't know if anyone remembers, but we had a product called Actimates, and it was an Arthur doll that interacted with children in the television when you used gesture. And so it was an idea way before its time. You didn't have you know, the processing capabilities, the uh, connectivity, and all the things that we have today to create these kinds of devices, but it was kind of fun to think through you know, how that's been evolving over time and why now is such an exciting time in the industry. And of course, the Kinect was a huge success on the Xbox 360. In some sense, you can attribute Kinect all the way back to that and all the work we've been doing in speech for a really long time. And I think even Kinect 1.0 was really just a feature of the Xbox, but now it is a way of working with a device and you're starting to see all kinds of proliferation of, of voice and gesture and vision into the way people are using technology today. And, and you see it all over the floor in CES. It's really exciting to see how you know, ideas become innovations. And these ideas that have impact, we really call innovations that change your life. Yeah, and of course, the Kinect is now very tightly integrated with the Xbox One. How long do you think it'll be before we see that sort of thing with a desktop or a tablet or maybe even Well, a there's Kinect for Windows today. Mm -hmm. And then we'll continue to evolve that. There's lots of really interesting things going on in the industry. Uh, in Intel had some interesting yep. announcements on the similar vein yesterday. Yeah, Mike, fill us in on some very briefly. Well, we have a whole uh, group that's dedicated to what we call perceptual computing. And the whole idea is that, you know, much like you showed in your video up there, there should be ways to interact with, uh, I won't just say PCs, PCs, tablets, some of the devices my team is working on, where you don't have to touch it, swipe it. I mean, when you think about it, if you're limited to touching and swiping, that defines the form factor and really limits the creativity mm, uh, of yeah. what you can build, right? Because if the hardware size is defined, that really you're sort of starting at a point you may not want to start starting yeah. from. So we're looking at getting uh, a, a really radical new hardware design, going back to the drawing board, if you will, and say, wait a minute, what can we pick up and sense versus what is intentional input and well, design think, for it? Well, I think we have to. And, and if you really want the promise of wearable technology to come forward, I think we have to think about it that way. Because if everything is just sort of a, a square thing on your wrist, it doesn't, it's not very interesting. Yeah. Sonny, what got you into, you're the, you've got the new startup here, two years of Misfit. What got you focused on a sensor-based device? Uh, you know, in my last company, we did glucose monitoring, meters and strips. And the last thing we did was a glucose meter that works with the iPhone. And the problem that that solved was being able to get people to test more because they just had their iPhone with them all the time, and therefore their glucose meter, which was attached to it. And so when we thought about the new company, what we were going to do, how else can we get technology to be used kind of passively? And so we thought, well, there's ambient sensing, kind of like what you guys are doing, in situ sensing, which is totally awesome. We just didn't know anything about it, so sorry. Not that startup <laughs> world. Uh, but then we looked at wearables. That's the other way of having technology with you all the time, is to wear it. So that's how we looked into that. And activity monitoring was kind of like the first uh, kind of lowest hanging uh, fruit uh, on the tree. And I think really in this day and age when we have sensors, we have this unprecedented ability to uh, gather uh, the, the volumes of data that we can. And it's mostly enabled, I think, because of, thi of, of this thing, uh, yeah. the smartphone and mobile internet. And so um, that's where we got started. But fitness and activity tracking are really just the beginning, I think. There are so many more interesting use cases for wearables beyond just a, a, a fitness tracking. Now, audience, you've already heard uh, from every one of our panelists just in the early chat here that this idea of redesigning devices has come up again and again, a chance to go with a clean slate and that form and function need to re-follow each other. Uh, when you change the way you interact with devices, you also change their look and feel by definition. In many ways, the sensor era could be opening up a new golden era for innovative designers. Let's take a look. In the early days of consumer electronics and personal devices, 
A gadget's appeal depended only on its level of function. These weren't devices that used sensors or other techniques to learn about you and fit into your lifestyle. Instead, it was you who had to figure out how to work with them. One look at models like the Motorola Dynatac or every laptop from the mid-90s, and you'll see that battery life, performance, and features always trumped beautiful design. Today, with gadget revenues measured in billions and store shelves stocked with device after device after device, all doing the same basic thing in subtly different ways, design becomes an important means of differentiation. For some, how a gadget looks and feels is just as important as how much it costs and how long its battery survives. Thanks in large part to Apple's videos obsessing over the value of good design, device aesthetics have quickly escalated from nicety to necessity. Phones like the HTC One, Nokia Lumia 900, and iPhone 5 look and act nothing alike, yet are beautiful and clean in their form and function. Design is an art form and great gadget designers are now considered artists. They've made their mark on the industry and the industry is better for it. But new shapes like the bendable LG G Flex and curved Samsung Round show us that design continues to evolve with technology. As this evolution continues, what shapes the next generation of device design? And with new sensors and new functionality making these devices ever more powerful, how will future user interfaces adapt to control them? Now, Julie, you've built a pretty big hardware team up there in Redmond for working on Surface pretty much from scratch. What did it take to build a team like that to be competitive? Uh, this day? Sure. It wasn't completely from scratch because we had the Surface table that we'd started before, which was a big you know, table for touchscreen computing. So we'd done a lot of work with that team uh, during Windows 7 when we added touch into Windows 7. And when we decided to go forward and make a tablet, we tapped that team to come over and along with the mouse and keyboard team and that started the genesis of it and we had uh, actually quite a few hardware people at microsoft from xbox and and uh, but we hired from the industry as well we have a, quite a good team now and excited about adding nokia to the bunch yeah absolutely now jim at ford you you guys are designing in the most unique atmosphere and perhaps the most constrained and regulated and liability ridden atmosphere you've got to do things to a little different set of constraints than anybody else up here uh, how does that affect your ability to really express what you think can happen? What can you do to pull sensors along quickly? Because there's always that comparison of the turn cycle of auto versus the turn cycle of CE. Well, I, I, I think you point out the, the constraints and the challenges. It's certainly great opportunities. We are in the end trying to create great experiences, overall great experiences in the vehicle. And a lot of these experiences people have outside of the vehicle, they want to bring in the vehicle, and it's a different environment. The first thing you're supposed to focus on is on, is on driving. And so dealing with driver distraction is important, dealing, helping drivers be better drivers, uh, driver performance, improving their, uh, assisting their ability to perform on the road and so on. So the ability to, for the vehicle and the, the uh, user, the driver, to interact in a way, in new ways, choosing the right kind of um, human machine interface for the right kind of function. Not every kind of, uh, not a single interface is best for every single function. And so the challenges, I'm, I'm excited about things like gaze detection, right? So, so as you look out the window, um, you can keep your hands on the wheels, eyes on the road, and ask, what's, what's ahead? What is that building? Um, you know, if you look at the, the use case of navigation, you know, we navigate from point A to point B, but, you know, really I want to get to a building, a location, a, an address, and, and I can't be looking at addresses all the time. It's much easier if you say that's the building, right? So it will be a combination of sensing. Gaze detection is, is great. Heads-up displays are great opportunities to keep your eyes on the road. So a combination of mashing all those things together and using the right interface uh, for the right situation. Now, as we look at the array of products that your companies and others represent, there is the possibility that they can collapse into a few devices, that I don't need a car and a phone and a wearable, all sensing a lot of the same stuff, motion, uh, some degree of vision, some degree of temperature. Is there a need for a few devices to work in all places? For example, a phone could do much of what you're saying in the car, not all of it, perhaps not as elegantly, uh, and could also do what the Shine does. Uh, are, are we trying to distribute sensor technology into too many buckets at this point, or is that just a factor of the early days? I'd say it's a factor of the early days that we're trying to make the all-in-one gadget that you keep in your pocket and does everything, yeah. and that that's not really where it's going to go. You're going to find sensor technology uh, that connects together through devices, and the, and the simplicity of the form factor is going to be more and more important over time. And the magic of the form factor, I think, starts out when it's a special purpose device. Like the first time I held a Kindle, 
It felt so magical to me that there was paper on the screen. But over time, you add more and more capabilities, and it becomes more functional, but loses some of the magic. And so I think we're going to find sensors in all kinds of things, and then you're going to get access to the data and information from those sensors through the cloud, through the internet, onto the device that you're using at the time when you care about. But it's really about finding the problems to solve and the most elegant way to solve the problem. I, I think, if, if I could add, uh, um, I'd draw a parallel to uh, applications, apps on phones, and so on. We don't need every single app in the vehicle itself. And um, a strategy we've taken with AppLink and leveraging the smartphone and connected devices is, hey, if Pandora is working great on your phone, all we need to do is add the right elements that make it work in our environment. We don't need to replace it. We don't need to have it actually run in the vehicle. Just let it continue to run on the phone, voice enable it, um, use some of the buttons in the vehicles, and leave it where it is. So um, leveraging those kinds of things in the different area that they are, uh, if it's on the phone or if it's uh, in another device, uh, in embracing that and certainly you know, standards and things are going to help us do that. Well, and that's, that's a really key point. I mean, if, if to, really rec to realize this concept of distributed sensing and things working together, we can't have islands of data. Mm -hmm. right. We can't have people building data silos out of proprietary products. We actually have to have interactivity, I mean, interoperability between these devices, or else the consumer is going to have one thing that does this and one thing that does that and one thing that does this, and they don't talk to each other, and that's going to be a crime. I mean, the promise mm -hmm. here is that you actually have a number of devices that all do something better together, so it's one plus one is three. And if we don't stop these proprietary data islands, we're going to have a big problem. And, and if I, I'd add to that is ecosystems as well, yeah. too. Um, we have to be agnostic to the right. phone that's brought into the vehicle. If it's an Android phone, if it's a Windows phone, uh, if it's an iOS-based phone and so on, you know, we have to make sure that our customer has a great experience with that. So how do, if my calendar is on Outlook and I have an iPhone and, uh, you know, I'm using Gmail, how does it still work just as well as if I'm totally in a in, uh, Google system or totally in a you know, uh, Microsoft ecosystem. Is there any progress toward that front, Mike? I mean, we've got Bluetooth LE, of course, that allows these devices to interconnect pretty easily, but then when we're talking about the actual data they're exchanging, there doesn't really seem to be any standards there not, yet. Not yet, and something I think is an industry we have to attack, and I think it's up to us to be proactive about that, because it's the consumer that loses if every one of their devices they have has its own web portal with data that can't be shared between them. And, uh, you know, it's something in Intel, we're, I mean, we're agnostic, operating system, you know, device, whatever. Uh, we think open standards are good and it's something that we intend to you know, be an advocate for. Oh, I want to ask you, Sonny, because you've, uh, you've got an interesting design uh, ethic first in the shine. As we're talking about device design, what are just a couple of quick lessons you learned that told you design had to come first? Because your device does, in theory, what a lot of others do in basic practice, but it doesn't look like them. Why is that so important? Um, well, when we first looked at the wearable space, we felt like this space was, in many ways, a misnomer. Um, many of these wearable products were not that wearable, not because you couldn't wear it in the able sense, but, but you, you wouldn't. Just, you wouldn't. <laughs> and, uh, and so we said, well, uh, and there was, an, uh, there was a kind of analogy to the pharmaceutical world and the medical devices world where I came from, where the top problem with many drugs is that you don't take them, and not because they don't work or whatnot. And so same thing with sensors, nothing more useless than a really accurate sensor that measures all the stuff that you don't use. So we said, okay, let's get people to wear stuff first. And then um, let's force the invention needed to, uh, I mean, this is not a lot of space to put sensors and wireless uh, uh, communication, all that stuff. But we said, let's figure out what people would wear and then let's put the electronics and sensors in it. And we, in fact, this sounds a little weird, but we almost didn't have a sensor in it because we couldn't fit it in. So we, it was just going to light up every time you touched it to kind of inspire you to be more active. And then we said, you know, we probably shouldn't do that. So. And why is, why was metal so important? That would seem to be trivial, especially in this age of all kinds of advanced plastics and other finishes yeah. that are no longer seen as cheap. They're seen as elegant yeah. in this modern age. Yeah. You went back to metal. You know, nothing wrong with plastic. I think it's just uh, uh, not really part of, of the wearing vocabulary of a lot of people, especially women, I think. Um, Cashmere, fur, leather, ceramics, gold, precious st stones. Those are the things that I think people like to wear, not plastic and rubber. And so we, we started by thinking, okay, let's set that aside and let's start with materials that aren't just uh, uh, you know, strong or perceived as not cheap, but things that you would actually just want to wear, the, where there was a, the, um, where it felt good wearing it and you would not feel weird wearing it. Uh, something that you could wear on your jacket just as well as you, to um, a, you know, a swimming party or whatever. 
And like, can we look a little further down the road maybe with you know, components continuing to be miniaturized and looking at flexible displays and flexible batteries? Uh, what is the future of wearable devices going to look like? Yeah, a couple thoughts. I mean, first of all, I think, I mean, I, I'm a, a, a believer that many wearables don't need displays. That it, it's a convention, it's a way of thinking that we just have rebrought from, from computing, uh, traditional computing, and we need to rethink the, the way we interact with these devices. If there's enough sensing uh, and enough other ways of input, the display actually goes away and I think makes wearables look a lot better. <coughs> the other thing that's interesting though, I mean, you know, we have our, I mean, Intel, our technology, the 22 nanometer, I mean, you know, we, means, what's it mean, right? I mean, we are producing transistors and chips that are so small. We're already at the point where you can build tiny things with it. Where we're limited is the battery life. I mean, I think the biggest thing holding back true adoption and, of, of these devices is the, the battery life when you want to have a small form factor device, and there's really been no big advancement in, in years. So this is something where we need a lot of work to go make that next big leap. You know, for a while it was fuel cells that sort of died out. And this, uh, Julie, tablets all look alike, if I can be blunt. Is that a problem, <laughs> or is that, does that just get a lot of needless differentiation out of the way and let the function shine more in the market? I think their tablets, you know, a lot of them do look alike. Squares of plastic, and they have things on the screen you click on. But not all of them look alike. Uh, I think the form is very important, how it feels, the weight, the way it's distributed, the uh, thinking through, you know, like some of the things we did with Surface to think about how the kickstand comes out and the viewing angles that you could sit at for the different heights of different people, um, what it feels like to hold, what orientation you're going to be using it in when you change orientations. There's a lot of detail that can go into the design um, that's not doesn't have to be you know, just a bigger phone which a lot of them are, and they look a lot alike. And I think Surface has had some impact on, on the design of some of the other devices that you're seeing at the show. We're really excited about that. And how important is design language in defining a family of devices? Well, one of the things we did when we started the hardware team at Microsoft is it wasn't just uh, the Surface hardware team. Um, it wasn't just about hiring great hardware engineers. It was also bringing together the software services and hardware into a full end-to-end -end package. And so design of Windows 8 and design of Surface happen together. So S Surface could be a stage for the Windows 8 device. So you know, thumbing in from the side or swiping up from the top, all of the precision around the edges of the touch screen, all those things had to work, be worked through. The orientation being set up for high definition television rather than regular television was also a design element from the software that went into the hardware design. And so that's really how we've been focusing on it being an end-to-end -end sort of starting from the metal all the way up to the full package of how the product feels and really focusing on you know, the end result of the product. Jim, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the things that happen in a car, the conventions <coughs> in a car of the controls are, are very tactile and not sense driven. <coughs> Knobs, slide, touch ribbons, all kinds of things that uh, you could imagine replacing a lot of what's in the car with sensors that are just responding to gesture mm -hmm. or just knowing <coughs> what I need next. But does that change the language, the design language that Tim mentions of, of cars in general too radically too soon? Do you have to proceed rather gradually there? Well, we have a wide group of customers as well too. You have different, different levels of tech right. expertise. And, and um, it, uh, for me, it's a define, how do you define what's intuitive, right? And certainly the consumer electronics industry and what people are used to with handsets and and uh, tablet devices and so on is influencing what's intuitive in the future. Um, but that doesn't necessarily automatically mean it's the right sort of interface in the vehicle. But we are definitely seeing with the amount of features and capabilities we can create in the vehicle, the experiences that we can create, we have to have an, interf an intuitive interface that people can learn very quickly, um, they can get what they want very quickly, and can work all across a, a wide range of consumers from um, you know, new uh, uh, young folks that are used to playing uh, video games and so on to folks that uh, you know are 60, 70 year old that um, you know just want very, very simple kind of interfaces. So in other words, you can't throw out the blue to red coated heat knob <laughs> all that soon, right? That's right. That's right. I mean, well, that's and a I, certain I, I think that's a great discussion too. Is in in terms of when you look at volume control, uh, rotary knobs versus sliders versus capacitive touch versus push, push, push. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, tuning is an example, one that uh, we talk about all the time. If you've got Sirius Satellite Radio with hundreds of radio stations and you're at Channel 1 you want to get to Channel 100. It's a long uh, trip. You know, when you think about how, how you can flip yeah. through very quickly and yet still accurately, then it says it's a different kind of interface than uh, maybe a capacitive touch or touch us. We're also on the road as well, too. We're vibra vibration and, and so on. And so, we, you know, the, the ability to have very accurate uh, uh, touches and so on is, is harder to do. So. Mm -hmm have to factor all those in, in our environment. Now, regardless of the design parameters and all these different concerns you've seen here, the heart of the sensor-based era is absolutely based on how it changes the data that's in play and the service that, is, that arise from that. Let's take a look at that. Sensor-based technology turns the user into one big data port and data drives services. Two major shifts are coming to them. First, passive monitoring. You don't need to consciously do anything to feed sensor-based technology information about you. From the band that harvests your activity, even when you sleep, to glassware worn by someone else noticing you, to the smartphone with voice recognition always on in the background. New services will be built beyond intentional preferences, clicks, and likes, and when done right, could seem like magic. Then there's physical state. Your physical condition has seldom been part of the data set about you, but it will be. Fitness, activity level, health, even mental state can be divined, or at least roughly guessed, by tomorrow's services. It would be nice to only see ads for cold medicine when you're actually sick. But will it be nice or eerie to see them when you're getting sick and didn't know it yet, but some service did? And all of this moves privacy concerns to a new level. Only about a third of Internet users today profess concern about wearables and privacy. But this is at a time when many of them don't know the hardware and platforms. More broadly, as these sensor-based services become ubiquitous, it might become harder to not share what they say about you. Your employer's health care plan may offer a discount for sharing your fitness band data or a less positive note in your profile for declining to do so. And as home sensors come to critical mass, perhaps they become required, as smart utility meters have been in some areas, creating smarter regional resource usage, but perhaps denying personal preferences that are wasteful. Will users ever warm up to passive monitoring? Is physical state a bridge too far when it comes to information sharing? And can all these services really solve problems or just present more information? So, Mike, we talked about this a little bit before, about the need to be able to share data between right. these devices. How exactly would that work? I mean, would we be talking about um, an extension to Android, for example, that's that's providing uh, connectivity for all these devices, or should they be able to connect to each other directly? Should it be an online-based service that they're connecting to? We've seen Apple with the M7 providing some basic level of, of integrated functionality with the iPhone 5S, right. but where does it make sense for this data to live, and how should it get there? Yeah, you know, it's one of the controversial questions, and, and even when you talk about wearables, there's the camp that says all the wearables should be tethered devices to a phone. You know, I personally think that the more of the devices need to be standalone, because it's part of the user experience. That the first thing you have to do is take the thing out of the box and pair it and connect it and make sure you have the right profile and this and that and the other thing. You're going to get some number of returns just based upon the fact that it's not branded simple. Um, now, there are some devices that have to be paired, right? Um, the data set itself, I mean, there's two things you're talking about. You could be talking about physically how do they connect. And then even, even if we say they're on the same Wi Fi network, how do I know what you are and what format your data comes in? So there needs to be not only standards for you know, maybe we use existing standards for physical connectivity, but then how do you discover devices and discover capabilities and discover data formats and things? There are already some industry standards for doing this. Uh, 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 Apple calls it Bonjour. Uh, there's a few others in the market that are very good at doing uh, discovery, uh, device discovery and, and protocol discovery and things like that. Uh, I think what we have to do, though, is figure out how for each of these devices we define what that data exchange format looks like. Are there any standards bodies that are kind of coming up? To you know, uh, I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure I can talk a lot about it, but I, we've been approached by a few very large standards bodies to start collaborating to put these kind of things together because they see, as we, as we show the promise of how all these sensor networks are going to make life better in cities and all, we're going to have a mess if it just generates a lot of data that you can't do anything with. 
Julie, there's no one that Microsoft's not talking to. What can you tell us on this front? <laughs> Maybe well, you'll leak where Mike didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just saw a really interesting product uh, earlier today called Live Home that does some of this for you around sharing your videos and photographs. So, you know, in your home, you have this basically your own personal mobile server. So whatever device you're using, everything's relaying back and letting you know where everything else is. So you don't have to think about what device you're using, but you get access to all the data and you know your photos and videos, no matter where they are. And so there's things like that. There's services like uh, you know, Microsoft's Microsoft ID, where all those things come with you with your device. There's lots of things out there. There isn't anything that's industry-wide in the standards bodies world, but I know there's lots of work going on in that area. Let me uh, see a quick show of hands in the room. How many of you are in any way employed in the advertising or media industries? Let's see these hands. Okay, so there's your room. They came to this panel because they want to get their hands on the data that all of you are going to be harvesting. <laughs> and we're How trying will to prevent this. Well, we're trying to prevent it to some extent, right? I mean, I, I think that you know, personal uh, ensuring people's per, you know, privacy of that data is very important. I think that. People should be able to share it if they want to, um, and in fact, maybe you should be able to monetize your own data. I think that's very important. But by default, these per these wearable devices, you know, security has to be job one. Um, there, you know, this we're talking about health information that could be used against people. We're talking about very personal information, and, and at the foundation of this hardware, you have to have a foundation of hardware level security before you start building these devices. I believe, especially when you're talking about people's health. Yes. And really personal information and keeping that you know, very private and under the control of the individual is really super important. Although I do believe they should be able to exchange that in, yep. in return for other benefits if they yep. want to, but it has to be their choice. I think keeping consumers at the center of it is really important. How do we help consumers gather the data and monetize the data and create value for them? Right. Right, uh, it is their data. If they choose not to share it for value and benefit, that's their choice, mm -hmm. right? And uh, if they choose to share it for new experiences and so on, so be it. They get the better experiences, but it's it's kind of turning it into a, you know, the the real data bank, right? You put some value on it and let them spend it if they choose to spend it. Uh, Sunny on the shine. Is there any way now or envisioned that any partners can access that data, anonymized or otherwise, aggregated? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in the wearables world, I think uh, many of us device makers are enabling open web API. Um, but they're actually quite, th th those things are quite limited in many ways because it requires an internet connection. It requires me to use you know, a certain app as opposed to the app that I really wanted. And so I think one of the things that we might see happening is devices connecting directly to, uh, to, to apps as opposed to having to go through various gateways. Um, way better user experience. Uh, it's just a matter of whether these device, uh, us device makers will be comfortable relinquishing that kind of communication control. And uh, I think hopefully the, the consumer will win out in this, you know, and that we will make this more available. So that's one of the things we're gonna do with Shine is enable people to communicate directly from Shine to their app as opposed to having to go through ours or whatnot. And in a market where people are excited about new hardware, how do you get people excited about new services that extend the existing hardware they've already got? You know, I think, uh, you know, we were talking about wearables earlier today, and I really think uh, the killer use cases for wearables, um, which I think will be primarily delivered through services, have not really been un uncovered yet. You know, uh, on the smartphone, I mean, I can't even imagine, I can't even remember the day when I couldn't make a phone call from my car, or send email on the go. Like it just it was it seems almost unimaginable that there was such a day and it was only fifteen years ago, right? Um, and I want I'm excited to find out what those what similar killer use cases will be that may only be possible in a wearable context. What those will be what those cases will be on which ones will be uncovered over the next say two to three years. And I believe there's probably two or three of those really killer use cases that I I don't know if sensing your activity or heart rate, whatever, is one of them, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and so we'll, we'll see. I you mean, talked with me earlier about a couple of things you do think could be killer use, killer, like, like access control. Access control, you know, wear, wearable data, uh, wearable identity and payments could be interesting. I don't know if it's killer, well, let's see. Yeah. Um, but hey, if I had a sensor that could predict a heart attack or a, a major cardiac event, Four hours ahead of time. Okay, that's pretty. That's well, I wouldn't say killer, but <laughs> <laughs> not if it works right. Not, not if it not works not right, not right. So, uh, but that's the idea. You know, okay, that's a pretty cool use case. I mean, that's a, an amazing use case. You know, life changing that kind of thing. 
Um, I wonder what the other ones would be. Uh, getting text messages on my watch? Mm, not sure, maybe. Uh, maybe I don't want that. Um, I think maybe. authentication is an undervalued one. Yeah. Like yeah. just knowing who you are and not having that extra problem of like typing in your pin. You see that with the iPhone now, being able to put your yeah. thumb there. It's changed my, my family's life to have it, uh, gesture and face recognition on the Xbox. You know, not having to use the remote anymore, having it know who I am, saying hi, Julie, when I sit down in front of the TV. It just changes the way you think about interacting techno with technology. Yeah. It's it, like it, what the it's magic. really important. Oh, sorry. Well, I was just saying, it's kind of like what the Magic Band uh, did for for Disney, where right. you know, it's it's this very exactly. simple device. I mean, unfortunately, it's only usable five days out of the year. But <laughs> if we had something like that, you know, for the rest of the year, yeah, yeah true biometric authentication, right. I do think is really it's it's going to be big. It's uh, it has to be spoof proof though. I mean, it can't be 95% accurate if people are going to rely yeah. upon it for banking and things like or that. Or to start your car, to open your house, exactly. or like, you know, yeah, do yeah. anything like that. Yeah. It has to really be you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're seeing some, uh, some startups doing that, like Bionim, where they do the heart rate monitoring authentic uh, authentication, uh, where, you, you know, where I guess your heart produces a unique uh, signature. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they, they, they use that as a fingerprint as opposed to your fingerprint. It's pretty accurate, but not quite enough yet. And then yeah. people start talking about multi-factor. Well, then when does it become a bigger hassle to do that than right. you just type a password? I mean, but technology is getting there. As you, when we talk about sensor-based computing on wearable devices, usually we're talking about glorified pedometer stuff, maybe heart rate. On the automotive space, though, there's certainly a lot of opportunities for services and data based on driver habits and that kind of thing. Can you give me some idea of what you're looking into it for? I, I think we're really excited about um, anticipating uh, this idea of uh, predictive search and so on and anticipating what you need and presenting to you at the right point in time. Again, this focus on driving and driver distraction and making sure that we're keeping you focused on the road. Um, if we can anticipate um, the best thing or the next thing you're going to need and present it to you in a very simple simple way by sensing whether it's you know sensing information about you by looking at your calendar or whatever it's going to make the experience much better and it's going to you know make that uh, proverbial uh, uh, magical experience that people are going to say I want to have it this thing my car helps me have a better life are you guys looking into any alternate forms of authentication? I mean, we still have a glorified key. Even if you don't actually put right. it in the ignition anymore, you still have it's, a key. It's, yeah. it, is, uh, it is very, very high on our list. But it, again, it has to be extremely, extremely accurate in the car as well, too. There is a lot of personalization that people want to do in their car, and they want to do more. When I get in the car, I like my settings. My wife likes her settings, not only just simple things like the seat settings, but, but if I have uh, uh, destinations I go to often and so on. Um, I want it set up for me. If uh, I have other kinds of setup in the vehicle, I want it set up for me. And again, putting in a number, a pin, and, and so on to get all those kinds of things, uh, you know, is, is just, people aren't just going to use it. They do want to go from point A to point uh, B and get it as simple as possible. Whether it's facial recognition and making sure that works, whether it's some of these other biometric uh, kinds of sensing. Um, we do have a pretty harsh environment, um, and so we've got to make sure it's extremely robust. But we're looking at all those kinds of things. So some of the things that come out of uh, of uh, connect in terms of the, the body structure and so on, differences. Um, we don't have to worry about sorting out 10,000 different people. You know, a half a dozen would be ju probably just fine. Um, but uh, it, again, it has to be very accurate for us. Is some of that accuracy that I'm hearing both in authentication and some other really critical, really uh, perhaps killer app applications, does that need the hardware to move and the services that are grabbing that data, do they need to have a higher bit rate, a higher bandwidth, a higher richness of data than we're able to throw off these devices now, or is that not a hurdle? Are we getting enough data thrown off of these at high resolution? Is I, that I a think problem? So, I mean, actually, I think, you know, to some extent, it, it's not the, I mean, we do need probably some better sensors. I'm not sure whether it's accuracy or just the ability to, it's, to differentiate through noise better, you know, to pr provide Signal an accurate, to noise ratio. Yeah, to get a better processing. SNR in, in an environment that may not be, and that may be not literally be noise, it may literally be you want to see through skin clearer. You know, mm -hmm. you need to do something when there's more opacity or it has to work for everyone's skin tone. I mean, there's lots of different ways to look at it. We have the compute power to be able to do some wild things if we can get the, the raw data to use it, to, to, you know, use the compute power on. So perhaps more a matter of filtering data than getting more of it. I'd say that's probably true. Okay. You know, I hope, uh, hopefully that is true because getting more data, more resolution means more power, more energy. And I agree. I mean, that's mm -hmm. totally the most difficult, one of the biggest barriers for all of us wearable makers, power. 
I mean, wearability design and making sure you don't look like a dork when you wear it is, okay, <laughs> that's important. Okay, Job one. Yeah, we're working on that. But the second, and like a very close second, is, uh, is power management. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the biggest complaints in our corner of the world was having to charge stuff, having to, you know, if you lose your cable, you know, and that was just a big annoyance. Mm -hmm. So that's what we tried to do is just, like, let's not ask people to charge things. So that's one of our commitments, make uh, wearable products that you don't have to charge, that you just, that you can just use. Um, you know, if you think back to the 70s, there were three things that you never had to charge, your computer, tablet, and your phone. And now we have more chargers than ever in this wireless world. And yeah, you um, may have the only product on the show floor that doesn't need charging. Congratulations. It's a battery. <laughs> I what forgot about batteries. Grief. When you mentioned the services aspect, I think adding in you know, machine learning and crowdsourcing to these devices is a huge part of filtering the data and figuring yeah. out what the data means and how you can make that applicable to someone. It's not just you know, your heart rate, but your heart rate compared with other people of your age doing the same kinds of activities you're doing and where you fall in that range. They're just starting. We don't have enough users of that sort of thing today yet to really be able to do as much as we, we can do and find those really sweet spot scenarios that people really care about that really resonate with them and part of their lives. Now we're getting well into our conversation here. I want to invite anyone who has questions to, uh, where's Allison? She's got the microphone and she's going to be, here she is, right in the middle of the hall. Allison from CNET's going to be able to come to you with the microphone if you have questions. We'll get to those here in just a moment. So let's get some, uh, a few of those teed up. It's a rare chance you're going to have this diversity and expertise of a panel in one place. Now, Mike, you mentioned uh, higher definition sensors, but are there any new sensors that you'd like to see in devices? I mean, I remember when it was interesting when your phone had a gyroscope, but now yeah. phones have barometric sensors and temperatures and humidity. Uh, it's kind of overwhelming, but is there anything new that you think we should have in our devices? Well, I tell you, you know, I don't think we're really taking advantage of the sensors that are in there today. I mean, we, um, in the latest Intel chips for, for phones, we have something we call Sensor Hub. It's, a lot, it's basically just what, like what Apple did with the separate bolt-on part. Ours is actually built into the main processor. And it's amazing from the sort of four or five basic sensors that we have today, with the right software algorithms, I can tell you stuff that you would have no idea how I guessed it. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it, it's, it's a lot of work. Bad. I mean, it gets, you know, it's crazy math that I don't pretend to understand all of it, but um, I don't think we've actually fully taken advantage of that yet. And it gets back to, we have to have a low enough power mode where the sensors are always running. So if it only runs every five or 10 minutes, it doesn't have enough accuracy to really give you interesting information. And I think we're finally getting there as well. Great. All right, I think we might have a question in the audience. Let's tee someone up. Give us your name and uh, who you're with, what you do here, what are you at CES for? Um, we, uh, we host the wearable fashion um, show in Calgary, Canada. Um, my wife and I just got our genome sequence, and I'm wondering if there's been any research from wearables technology to compare you know, your you know, epigenetics or your, the, the data of your life against your genome to figure out you know, what your best eating regimen or exercise regimen might be. We talk about, when we're talking about data, I mean, there's a huge data set in, yeah. our, in our genome that would be... That you're, it's already in you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't need to be harvested. You're carrying it around. <laughs> Anyone that, know about any intersections in that area? Would that require a device, or would that simply be a service of some sort? Sounds Sorry. like a cool yeah. startup idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So you just give Sonny an idea. Take that and get some Lots of buzzwords. Yeah, I think that's that's big data, yeah. blah, blah, Big data, right. genome, yeah, sensing. I mean, man, that's figuring out the food you eat is hard. There's a, there's a product, I don't remember the name of it, that's doing that. So it'll, you know, try to figure it out. But knowing what, you, what portions you have in front of you and how many calories it is, that's a, that's a problem that's been trying to be solved for a long time. It's very hard. That in itself, yeah. Uh, we have another question right here. Because I the, say the pie is only this big. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that would also be a, uh, a data filtering question. Let's go to the uh, next lady we have here. Hi, hi oh, there. Next gentleman here. Uh, hi there. Um, one of the things I've noticed with all the proliferation of apps and all the rollout and adoption rate being very high of the technology is that bandwidth is getting harder to come by. There's dead spots, there's little bits of data you can get. Um, have you thought much about uh, like bandwidth sharing? Let's say there's 10 people in this area here and they all have some aggregate amount of bandwidth that they're able to get that they're not using. And I'm in their area and I need a little more. How can, how can you guys figure out some kind of topology or mesh networking that helps share available bandwidth, bandwidth so the ones with the need get the bandwidth when they need it and then the ones that are idle kind of give it up for that time frame? It would certainly help these data-hungry apps uh, perform better. Um, any, uh, 
Any bandwidth availability intersections with the kind of sensor devices we're talking about? Or is it all local, personal area network? Well, let me tell you his question. I'd actually argue that the current pricing models for all you can eat data plans are, are assuming you don't do that, right? Because, I mean, if in fact you can start brokering unused data, I mean, you can see where you could really kind of rapidly. Remnant data. Yeah, you could really rapidly fill up. You know, the, the, the pricing models are based upon some amount of people not using what they're paying for, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm not sure the carriers would be all that happy if, if you started to do that. I mean, could you do it? Sure. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's just a matter of engineering, right? Mm -hmm. um, but um, I, think, I think you would really take some changes in the way we in the U.S. pay for our data plans to really make this something that would fly. We have another question uh, in the center of the hall. This lady's been waiting patiently. I'm Skylar. I'm 13 years old. And I was wondering if someone has a device that's providing sensor data, and maybe they want to compare their data, but they don't want to share it. How would that work? And also, what are the privacy implications of having these always-on sensors that are constantly providing information that someone may not want to share? That's a great question. Didn't Sorry, mean to call you lady, Skylar. Thank <laughs> you for your forbearance. The lights are right in my eyes. Sonny, do you have any insight into a safe way to socially share your data? You know, um, there's a lot of, uh, you know what's interesting? I heard a story from, uh, uh, I think it was the CEO of Lose It, where he was talking about how there's, um, you want to share your data with different types of people, not necessarily your friends. Mm -hmm. So there, there was an interesting story where they, people did not want to share their data, their data about how much, about that they're trying to lose, they're trying to lose weight with their friends. They just wanted their friends to compliment them that they lost weight. <laughs> uh, but they wanted to lose weight with people that they, that were trying to lose the same amount of weight, same kind of background. And so I think it's tricky. You don't always want to share this data. Sometimes there's a privacy thing, and sometimes you really do want to share it. So it's, it's not, I don't think it's just about uh, pri privacy. It's about, it's, I think maybe it's selective privacy. Is, is a solution like we see in, in Facebook with lists of, of trusted friends, is that a good enough solution, or does there need to be something more advanced here? Uh, you know, I, 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 <laughs> yeah. well, well, we, we actually have um, some work on this area around anonymization of data because uh, to make a lot of the stuff work that we talked about, you, you want to have crowdsourced data. You want, you want people to be able to share their data. Perhaps they get some monetary return for it, but you have to ensure that privacy. So you could actually think of uh, a trusted data anonymization bank as a company that is able to take in data, assure privacy, and then help do the comparisons and give the results without you know, giving personal information. I think that's actually something that's not too far off. And Julie, there's actually been a lot of talk about that with the Xbox One because right. the Kinect is always watching you and always monitoring you. Right, but it's How not sending anything back. Okay, it's so it's just all keeping track of, of what you're, you know, you're doing with the device. It's not sending anything back over um, that's personally identifiable uh, information. But I was surprised that for a 13-year-old to be worried about privacy because my son seems to be Snapchatting everything that he does. <laughs> He's 13. And, but, so maybe I should have you talk with him. <laughs> Your generation was supposed to have forgotten what privacy is. <laughs> Until they try to get into college. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. Um, I, we have any one question. One Allison's question. got one. You get to have the last word, sir. Tell us who you are and what you're doing here at CES first. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Shishir. I work with a company called Mobility360 based out of Hong Kong. So the question is, uh, we have got various sources of data. One is the sales level data coming from the CRM system of the company. What is a consumer purchasing? Other is a lot of the social media data, which is on Facebook, about the interest of a consumer. Plus this variable data getting shared with friends on Facebook. So how can a marketer bring all these together to, to suggest the right uh, product or service for the consumer. How can all this data, the big data, come together in terms of right marketing activities or advertising activities? So how do we define basically a, a globe of data around an individual, including wearable data and, and fitness data, plus social data, plus me saying I'm happy today on Facebook, that kind of thing? Is there plus the CRM data, the sales data also, the credit yeah. card data. So how can all this be brought together for better marketing programs? So what are the group's thoughts on that? I think we should end with a small question <laughs> to make this easy, right? Thank you. Thoughts? Or should we not even go there? I, you know, I mean, honestly, my group is, is working on the technology and the gadgets. I do think this is something we're going to have to worry. I mean, it's the next level up, right? Once you get all this data, I do think it's important, again, not only do we need to figure out, you know, the, the things that are gathering, generating this data, how much do they send back or how much do they process? There's the distribution of the data. Then once it comes back, how do you put it together and make sense of it? I mean, sure. we're doing a lot to create data, but then to your point, I mean, how do you make it useful? 
Well, sir, I think next year we'll have someone from the NSA on the panel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there right. already was. Yes. You just didn't know it. <laughs> hey. All right. I want to thank all of our panelists, Julie Austin Green from Microsoft, Jim Mikowski from Ford, Mike Bell from Intel, and Sonny Boo from Misfit. Thank you very much for joining us. Let's have a hand for our panelists. Yeah.